Good morning, everyone, for the Day of Atonement. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16 and 17, it says, Three times in a year shall all the males appear before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose. Okay, verse 16 and 17 of Deuteronomy chapter 16. Three times in a year shall all your males appear before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in the Feast of Weeks, that's Pentecost, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, or it means the tabernacle season when you compare it with other scriptures like Exodus chapter 13 and 14. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty. It means however God has blessed you, you should be prepared to give a donation. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. So it's obvious if God has not blessed you, you are not able to give as good of a blessing. So you should not be embarrassed by it. You should know that God looks at the heart. If you can give a donation, then of course you should give according to as God has given to you. So at this time, we will pass the basket and take up a donation. God has been good to us, and we have um, been reaching many, many people through radio and television, and we're having a lot of new response. Our Restoring Knowledge magazine, which is strictly doctrinal and is only to be given to those who request it. We never send it to anyone who does not request it. It now exceeds half of our Newswatch mailing list. So hopefully over a period of time, we definitely will see a harvest from that. Now before the sermon this morning, we'll have one scripture reading by Sherry Linton. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. But the priestly work that has been given to Jesus is much greater than the work that was given to the other priest. In the same way, the new agreement that Jesus brought from God to his people is much greater than the old one. And the new agreement is based on promises of better things. If things were not, if there was nothing wrong with the first agreement, there would be no need for a second agreement. But God found something wrong with his people, he says. The time is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new agreement. It will be with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. It will not be like the, the agreement I made with their ancestors. That was when I took them by the hand to bring them out, out of the land of Egypt. But they broke my agreement. I turned away from them, says the Lord. In the future, I will make this agreement with the people of Israel, says the Lord. I will put my teachings in their minds, and I will write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. People will no longer have to teach their neighbors and relatives to know the Lord. This is because all will know me from the least to the most important. I will forgive them for the wicked things they did. I will not remember their sins anymore. God called this new agreement, so he made the first agreement old. And anything that is old and worn out is ready to disappear. Second reading is Hebrews 6:20. Jesus has gone in there ahead of us and for us. He has become the high priest forever, a priest like Melchizedek. Second, the third reading in Hebrews 7, 1 through 2. Melchizedek was the king of Salem, and the priest was the most high God. He met Abraham when Abraham was coming back after defeating the kings. When they met, Melchizedek blessed Abraham, and Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything he brought back from the battle. First, Melchizedek's name means king, king of God, Godness. Also, he is the king of Salem, which means king of peace. When you look at Leviticus chapter 23, it's the only place in the entirety of the Bible where it does give a listing of all the holy days in one place. When you read about the Day of Atonement, it says you're to afflict your soul. Then when you look up the word afflict and trace it through the Strong's Concordance, you'll come up with Psalms, the book of Psalms, that tells you how you afflict your soul. You afflict your soul with fasting. 
Then when you trace the word fasting throughout the Bible, you find that fasting according to the biblical way. Now, I'm not talking about man's way where it's a juice fast where you only drink juices and you're going to lose weight. I'm talking about God's fast. You neither eat nor drink anything from sunset one night to sunset the next night. And it allows you to be humbled to realize that without the nourishment, then you would die eventually. So God sustains us. Well, what does the word atonement mean to us? Has it a definite meaning for just us as individuals who understand the truth of God? Or does it have a significant meaning for the entirety of the world? Is God, or has He, been put in a straitjacket by the religions of this world so that he cannot save according to them? Or does the Bible teach something totally different? Is it that we as a religious world, I'm talking about all religions combined, and especially those of Christianity, have they actually said to God, you must go by our concepts? And you can't save anybody except who we say you can. And anyone who's not a part of our little church cannot receive salvation. Or does the Bible teach something so magnificent that truly those who understand it have the good news that Jesus brought, that He came to atone for the world, not just for those that these churches say that he will atone for. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, Now the Lord had said, that's past tense, unto Abram, get you out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house unto a land that I'll show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You shall be a blessing. This is Abraham and Abraham's descendants. And I will bless them that bless you, and curse him that curses you. And in you, that's Abraham and his descendants, throughout all generations, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God called Abram. At a specific time, Abram answered the call and left Ur of the Chaldees. He was told that all the nations of the earth, every person that was ever born and drew breath, the breath of life, into his nostrils, and he became a living soul. Every person would have the opportunity to be blessed because of Abraham and his seed. In chapter 17 of Genesis, chapter 17, verse 1 through 7, And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, so here's a ninety-nine year old, there's nobody in here that old, I don't know if he walked on crutches, I don't think so, it says, The Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be you perfect. Now we know Abraham was not perfect. When you look up this word, it's number 8549. It means sincere of heart. Now anybody can be sincere of heart but make a mistake. David did. King of Israel, a man after God's own heart. So God wasn't commanding Abraham to be perfect and never make a sin, but be sincere, genuine before him. I'll make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. So here was a covenant to be made between Abraham and God. And Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. Neither shall your name any more be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, which is plural. For a father of many nations have I made you. I will make you exceeding fruitful. This is physical genealogy. And I will make nations come of you, and kings shall come out of you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you in their generations. Notice it's plural there, one generation rises up, they produce children, that generation dies out, the next generation is alive, produces more children, and whatever generation it is, God said, in that generation, I'll continue to make my covenant with those people. 
for an everlasting covenant. There it is, an everlasting covenant. Everlasting is number 5769 in the Strong's Concordance. The actual Hebrew word is olam. It means time out of mind, both in the past and in the future. You can never think of a time when God will not have His covenant with these people. Abraham's descendant. And it's through Abraham's seed that every other nation on earth, the Gentile nations, will have opportunity to be blessed also. To be a God unto you and to your seed after you. Now drop down to verse 9. And God said unto Abraham, You shall keep my covenant there for you and your seed after you in their generations. So whatever this covenant is, and I admonish you to make sure you're there for the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. It's going to be a dramatic sermon. But anyway, God's covenant would be with Abraham and his seed in each succeeding generation. As long as there is a sun, as long as there is a moon in the sky, according to Psalms 89 and other places in the Bible, as long as there is a covenant with a moon and the sun, and they orbit, and the earth orbits the sun, and the moon orbits, and it comes up, there will never be a time when this covenant will not exist. Now the people may not obey it, they may be in rebellion to God, but the covenant that God has will always be there for those in that generation that will accept it. Israel went into Egypt. This was Abraham after he died, Isaac after Isaac died. Here was Jacob, and he had 12 sons, and a famine came in the land of Palestine. So he took his sons after Joseph had been sold into Egypt. They went into Egypt, and they survived the famine. They became slaves to the Egyptians. They were forced seven days a week to work. Forced labor. Slave labor. They lost all track of anything to do with God. They didn't even know what day was the Sabbath day. They didn't know anything about the holy days anymore. They didn't know very, but very little about the very God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Finally, God appeared to Moses, and he brought them out of Egypt. It was a type, a physical type of salvation, just like the spiritual type is for us today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I want us to make sure that we understand without doubt who it was that brought these people out of Egyptian bondage. This was not an old father God that was old and fuddy-duddy, and he was a harsh, mean person. No, it wasn't. Look in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant, how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. They saw this great God of the Old Testament, this great, if we ever know how to pronounce it before he returns, Yahweh, this God of the Old Testament, they saw him up there in the cloud, they didn't see him in person, but they saw the brilliance. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So when they went through that Red Sea and it parted and stood up on both, side, both sides, the entire nation went through that Red Sea. And that was baptizing the nation. Now that was a type of the future baptism that we would have. That was physical, ours is spiritual. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. The very person that came and was born through Mary, and his stepfather was Joseph, this person who died for our sins was the very person that led Israel out of Egyptian bondage. In John chapter 8 in the New Testament of the Bible, John chapter 8, it just shows what Jesus had to say about His coming. Verse 27 to 29. They understood not that He spake to them of the Father. So Jesus is revealing now that there is a Father also. So He's not the only individual God or supreme deity in the universe. 
Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me. I speak these things. And He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please Him. So Jesus was sent of the Father, the Father of the God family. Or in the Old Testament language, the Elohim family. Jesus was sent to create the world. He was sent to become the Savior of that creation. He will reconcile the world back to the Father. Then when Israel came through 40 years of wandering, before that, was over with, and before they went into the land of Palestine, the land of Canaan, they came up to Mount Sinai. This person, Jesus Christ, re-delivered the terms of the covenant to Israel after coming out of this captivity. Let's go back now to Exodus chapter 19. They've now been told by Moses to wash yourself, prepare yourself for several days. Get yourself clean, become holy, and then approach to the mount. But no one can touch the mountain itself. In verse 5 of Exodus 19, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice and deed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. This was the destiny of those people. They were to be the showcase for the world of obedience to God's covenant. If they would have obeyed all of God's covenant to perfection, every blessing that God offered them, rain in due season, so they would have absolute astonishing crops to the rest of the world because of obedience. Children where there would never be a deformity, there would never be diseases, sickness. He guaranteed physical perfection for these people if they would obey His covenant. Notice verse 8. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So they agreed to the covenant. They said, we'll perform it. Everything God says. Well, in verse 1 to 3 of Exodus 20, let's notice now who it was standing on the top of Mount Sinai, and he thundered down with his godly voice, and they could not stand to hear it. Verse 1 to 3, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, which have brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Wasn't that what I said in 1 Corinthians 10, 1-4? You shall have no other gods before me. You see, ancient Israel did not know there was a Father. You and I do because Jesus revealed it to us. They only thought this individual was the only God there was. But Jesus came and revealed and declared that there was a Father who was greater than He. But Jesus told those people, I am the one dealing with planet earth. He told us in the New Testament, the Father sent me, He's been with me. I only do what He sent me to do. He created. He knelt down and breathed in the nostril of Adam. And He became a living soul. He created all that we see on planet earth. Jesus presently sustains and upholds everything. He even gave and spoke all of His laws, statutes, and judgments in Exodus 20, 21, 22, and 23. This was the heart and core of the constitution of all of God's law. Jesus, the Savior, and the one who's going to reconcile the world back to the Father is the one who gave these things. So when ministers come along in the 20th century and say, Oh no, Jesus did away with all of those things. Why would Jesus do away with His own law? 
It doesn't even make sense. That tells me they don't even know who the God of the Old Testament was. Or else they wouldn't make such statements. In Exodus chapter 24, here is Jesus Christ. In verse 3, And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said will we do. They accepted. Now notice that this covenant was ratified with blood. Verse 7 and 8. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. Notice now it wasn't just the two tables of stones with the Ten Commandments. This was a book of the covenant that God gave to Moses and Moses wrote it in the book. And they said, all that the Lord has said will we do, and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. So blood ratified the covenant. Israel now was to obey God, and yet they rarely did. Very seldom was there ever a king that was raised up that ever obeyed God and tore down the, ho the church houses of that day that contained all the idols. They violated the covenant at every turn. In every generation. To be exact, one generation came along and a prophet of God, Isaiah, killed 430 priests of Baal. And then he ran for his life because evil Jezebel said, By this time tomorrow, I'll have your life. And he ran for his life and said, God, I'm praying to you. Kill me. I'm the only one left. And in a dream that night, God told him that there were 7,000 left that had not bowed their knees to Baal. So there are some in every generation that will keep the covenant of God. They'll be few and far between, but they're there. Ancient Israel never set the example of being an holy nation, except on a few occasions here and there. As a direct result of their disobedience, God did something. And remember in the New Testament, in Romans 15 verse 4, it said, everything written in the Old Testament is an example for us today. It, it shows how God dealt with them physically and he deals with us spiritually. In Jeremiah, one of the longest prophecies of the Old Testament, chapter 3, God showed what his attitude toward ancient Israel was because they continued to disobey. Verse 6 through 10, And the Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, have you seen that which backsliding Israel has done? Remember, by this time, the nation of Israel was divided into the northern ten tribes and the two southern tribes that was called Judah. They were separate nationalities now, separate nations. And your Bible maps show the division after Solomon's death and King Rehoboam took over. She, that's backsliding Israel, is gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree. And there has played the harlot. They would set up groves in which they went and worshipped their false gods. And they would have sex orgies because they worshipped sex as the progenitor of life. And I said after she had done all these things, turn you unto me. But she returned not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Israel wouldn't repent, and the southern two tribes of Judah and Benjamin saw what was going on. And I saw when for all of the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. God divorced unfaithful Israel. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So all of the Israelites, none excluded, disobeyed God. Verse 9, And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom. She didn't even care. It was a light thing to her. 
that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. And yet for all this her treacherous, sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart. But feignedly or pretendingly, says the Lord. So Israel and Judah both broke God's covenant. God sifted Israel, the northern ten tribes, through the nations. Then Judah was left and finally taken into Babylonian captivity and spent 70 years there in punishment. But they were brought back. And the only reason they were brought back, not because they were faithful to God, was because their Savior was to be born through Judah. They had to stay in that land until our Savior Jesus Christ was born and fulfilled every prophetic utterance of the Old Testament. After that was fulfilled, Judah also was sifted through the nations with the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. Let's turn now to Isaiah chapter 53. This is a prophecy of that one Savior that would come. And even Gamaliel said, warn the people when Jesus was on trial. And the apostles, when they were trying to round them up, that one must die for the people. Verse 1 through 7. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus was an ordinary guy of his day, in looks only. He is despised, why? And rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Why? Because he was perfect. He had no sin. And human nature is revolted at goodness. You think about it for a minute. We all like to think we're good, don't we? But then when we break God's law, I mean, it's okay because we did it. See, that self-righteous attitude? And we hid, as it were, our faces from Him. He was despised, and we esteemed Him not. Surely He hath borne our griefs. This is why He came. Every grief and sorrow that you and I and everybody else in the world has ever known, Jesus is willing to take it upon Himself and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. You know what? The penalty of sin is death. Every one of us deserved death. And if it hadn't have been for these verses right here and Jesus Christ fulfilling them, that's what we would receive. Death. Atonement means the cancellation. And it's the cancellation of sin. Verse 5. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, not His own. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes... We are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. Remember Proverbs 16.25? Every man has gone his own way. And whatever is right in his own eyes, that's what he does. But God won't accept that. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Every sin that's ever been committed... Since the first one in the Garden of Eden to the very last one before all sin is taken from the earth, every sin will be placed upon Jesus Christ. And if you and I don't accept that person with all of our heart, from the depths of our being and the sacrifice that He made for us, we're not a Christian. Verse 7, He was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet He opened not His mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was willing to take all of this punishment for us and never complain once. Drop down to verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. See, he said he came to do everything the Father told him to do. 
the Father had predetermined before the world began that He would become a sacrificial lamb to reconcile the world back to the Father. He hath put Him to grief when you shall make His soul an offering for sin. He shall see His seed. He shall prolong His days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in His hand. So the very work the Father has sent Jesus to do will succeed. It is God's good pleasure to reconcile the world back to Himself through His Son, Jesus Christ. The last part of verse 11. By His knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This was the prophecy of what Jesus Christ would do for you, for me, for every person that has ever walked this earth and drawn breath. In Jeremiah chapter 31, because Israel and Judah were sent and dispersed through the nations, because of their sins and failure to be that holy nation to show the rest of the world what would happen if they would obey their God and keep the covenant, God said, I will make a new covenant with them. Notice in Jeremiah 31 the prophetic utterance of that prophecy. Verse 31 through 34. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Notice there was nothing wrong with the covenant. It was the people. They broke the covenant. The covenant didn't break them. Although I was a husband unto them, says the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. It does not say I will abolish that old law because they couldn't keep it. It says I'll put that same identical law inside of them. In their heart, in their mind, their attitude. Write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. Now this is very important. For us to understand, because if those ancient Israelites died, how in the world can God ever make a covenant with them if the churches are right today? That say, if you don't accept Jesus today and you're baptized before you walk out the door and you die, you're going to hell and burn forever. These people are gone. So are the churches right? Or have they missed whole books of the Bible? The church I grew up in, I brought these scriptures to the ministers when I began keeping God's holy days in the Sabbath. And there were five Church of Christ in the city of Anniston, Alabama. My mother, bless her heart, set me up an appointment with each one of them trying to convince me that I was wrong. I would show them this and point out the scriptures. And they said, well, we know that those people didn't have a chance for salvation. God will take care of them. And when I would show them how he would take care of it, they would say, oh, you just don't understand the Bible. Right here, God is showing what he's going to do. And you show somebody, they don't believe it. They say, yes, we believe in God, but surely that's not the way it's going to be. But it is. We're going to find out how God is going to atone. Today and the first couple of sermons at the Feast of Tabernacles. Now let's turn into the New Testament because here is a prophecy in the Old Testament showing there would be a covenant, a new covenant. Not a new set of laws, but a new covenant 
made. And all a covenant is, is a contract or agreement. Here is going to be a new agreement to keep the same set of laws. But we're going to see what in the world it was about that old agreement that they couldn't keep. And then what is good about the new agreement. In Hebrews chapter 8, start in verse 6. But now hath he obtained, this is talking about Jesus, a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Notice what this verse does say now. It says there will be a better covenant. It does not say better laws. How can you get better than perfection? Psalms 19.7 says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. So if the law of God is perfect, converting the soul, isn't that what we want? Then why do away with that which converts? No, he said it will be a better covenant and it will be established or based upon better promises. It's the promises for obeying that same law that's better. Now verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, it was the people that failed to obey the laws. He says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant. And I regarded them not. And we saw where he divorced them. So it wasn't God's law. It wasn't his covenant. It was the people that did not have the spiritual capability of obeying that law. For this is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. I will be, a, I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. They shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Total forgiveness. That's what atonement means. Cancellation of sin. Verse 13 now. And this verse is so totally misunderstood that most churches today gag on it. They don't know what to do with it. In that he says a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decays and wax old is ready to vanish away. And what happened? God set up temple worship, all the ceremonial part of it, the washing of pots and pans, the offering of animal sacrifices. He set up the whole system. And now, with the destruction of Jerusalem coming on, it was going to vanish away. And the old covenant was going to become obsolete. And now the new covenant would be made. And the new covenant was the same laws, but it was God's everlasting covenant that He gave to Abraham. Not the sacrificial system that was given later. So now, from these verses right here, we must conclude, if we believe exactly what it says, that it's the same set of laws would determine sin. The new covenant would have better promises. Some of those better promises were, the Holy Spirit would be given to give us the power to obey. Another one of those good promises was forgiveness of sin. They had no forgiveness in the Old Testament. All they did when they sinned was went and offered an animal sacrifice, rolling their sins forward, looking to the day when they'd be forgiven. The Old Covenant, people died under two or three witnesses. Under the New Covenant, we're forgiven. All we do is go and ask God to sprinkle His blood on the mercy seat before the Father in the heavens. And his own personal blood, the blood of a God, is worth more than all the blood of every person that's ever been born. And then another one of those promises was the everlasting life would be offered. 
instead of temporary promises of food, good crops, rain, healthy children, and so on, it would actually be based upon everlasting life. No sickness, no disease, none of those things anymore. Now let's turn to John chapter 1, verse 29. Here is John the Baptist. He was born six months before Jesus. He knew that he was to be a prophet of God. You know, it's interesting, but John the Baptist never worked one miracle. Not one. <clears throat> John 1, 29. Now the next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold, he points at him, the people standing around, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. So now they had a, he had identified Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God. Now let's look at a strange ceremony that took place in the Old Testament. In Leviticus chapter 16, this is something that the Old Testament priests went through every year in the temple. Verse 5 to 10. And he shall take of the congregation. Now this is the high priest. and At first it was Aaron. He had to offer a bullock for himself and his family because even the high priest had sins. And then it said, He shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two goats, or two kids of the goats, for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement or a cancellation of sin for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats. Now they were to be identical. They were to be without blemish, no sin. Therefore they both represented Jesus Christ, our Savior. Both of them did. One lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Now that's interesting that it would talk about a scapegoat. You know what the word scapegoat is? It's number 5799 in the Hebrew Strong's Concordance of the Hebrew language. All it means is a goat of departure. That's all it means. There is no other meaning to it. Goat of departure. So here was one goat. Let's pick it up now on verse 9. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. Didn't we just read that Jesus was to be the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world? He was to die and become an offering for sin. Now let's go to verse 10. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat or goat of departure shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with Him. Now, what did Jesus do? We know that during the days of unleavened bread, there was called a wave sheep offering. Jesus died late or on, on late Wednesday. Three days and three nights later, he was resurrected from the grave late Sabbath afternoon. When the people got to the tomb early that morning, while it was yet dark, Sunday morning before the sun ever came up, it was still dark. Read John and Matthew the last chapters, and so on. You'll find that Jesus was already gone. Then when the ladies, He appeared to them, He said, Touch me not. I have not yet ascended to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. So Jesus was that wave sheaf offering the very first harvest from a physical fleshly body to a glorified spirit body. So he had to ascend to the Father to be accepted. What has he done today? Didn't he depart this earth? He was a goat of departure. But he was alive, wasn't he? Because they couldn't resurrect a goat back there. So they had to have two goats. One for the sin offering. And then the other was a goat of departure. Where Jesus was depart this earth and sit down at the right hand of the Father. And he would be the atonement. To make atonement with the Father for us. 
Because it says, shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with Him. So here's Jesus now dying for our sins. He paid the penalty of death. But He was resurrected and went to the Father in the heavens. Sitting at the right hand and every time we make a mistake, He's sprinkling His blood on the mercy seat. And He forgives our sins. He's made the atonement with the Father for us. He's alive. Well, Hebrews 6, verse 20. The New Testament bears out that Jesus definitely would be a living high priest. Not a dead high priest. Chapter 6 of Hebrews, verse 20. Referring to Jesus, whether the forerunner is for us entered. This is into the Holy of Holies. You see, only the high priest could go behind that veil in the temple and offer a sin offering once a year. That was all. And that represented the Father's throne. But now Jesus, who now has died for our sins, He is our high priest now. He has entered for us, even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus departed this earth, entered into the very throne room of the Father in the heavens as our high priest. He's pioneered the way for us so we also can go into the Holy of Holies with our prayers today and the Father will hear. And Jesus continually offers His shed blood for our sins. Every time we make a mistake, we go and ask forgiveness, and He is alive to perpetually, at all times, cover those sins and cancel them. Chapter 7 of Hebrews, verse 1 and 2. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, and if you want to read about that, you have to go back to uh, Genesis chapter 14. And you'll see where Abraham actually gave him a tenth of the spoils. So was tithing known back then? Yes, it was. Verse 2, To whom also Abraham gave a tenth, part of all. First, being by interpretation king of righteousness. After that also, king of Salem, which is king of peace. So Melchizedek was Jesus of the Old Testament at that point in time. Abraham understood tithing. He gave a tenth. And in Genesis 26, verse 5, it says that Abraham obeyed my, Jesus Christ's voice, kept my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. How could Abraham do that if he didn't know about the covenant? Jesus Christ taught him the covenant. Now verse 3, Hebrews 7. It's talking about this new high priest now that's gone into the heavens. He's immortal. He lives forever. Without father, without mother, without descent. Neither having beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abides a priest continually. So here now the writer of the book of Hebrews is beginning to compare Jesus as our high priest with the physical Levitical priesthood. Notice now in the comparison as we go on down through here, the Levites had physical human parents. But Jesus gave up being the God of the Old Testament to be placed into the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit. He had no beginning by a physical human life other than the Holy Spirit put him into Mary so he could have a human form for a while. And Joseph was his stepfather. Not his real father. God is. And then another comparison is the Levites were born a certain day and died a certain day. And they kept records. Jesus was alive before being put into Mary. And was alive from the grave. He was resurrected and He's alive forevermore. So where those Old Testament high priests would live and die, Jesus 
never dies. He died once as a sin offering, but was resurrected. In John 17, 5, and keep your fingers here in Hebrews, we'll be right back to it. But John 17, 5, Jesus made a special prayer. Just before He was to be taken out, and He would be exposed by Satan and his agent as the person to be crucified. And now, O Father, glorify you, or glorify you me with your own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus had glory, immortality, with the Father before the world existed. And Jesus was the one that the Father sent to create all things. He was to be the reconciling agent of the human race back to the Father. And now He has ascended to the high priest job forevermore. Now verse 5 through 11 of Hebrews chapter 7. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, here they're physical, fleshly, human beings, who receive the office of the priest priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law that is of their brethren though they come out of the loins of Abraham they were descended from Abraham and yet the comparison is Jesus wasn't he was before Abraham remember remember in the book of John where the scribes and Pharisees were getting upset with Jesus and, and he asked them about Abraham and he said before Abraham was I am he existed before Abraham was ever born. And that's when they decided to kill him after that because he made himself God. Verse 6. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. So Jesus existed before. He was the one that took tithes of Abraham. And yet none of the Levites had ever been born yet. Verse 7. And without all contradiction, the less that Abraham is blessed of the better. Here is a God that blessed Abraham, a physical human being. Verse 8, And here men that re did receive tithes, but there he received them of whom it is witness that he lives. So here, the Old Testament Mikkel, um, <laughs> Melchizedek priesthood, received tithes of Abraham. And yet, the rest of the Levites weren't even born yet. And yet, the same Melchizedek priesthood now exists through Jesus. And He's alive forever to take tithes of all people. Verse 9, For as I may say, Levi also, who received tithes, paid, Ab paid tithes in Abraham. Why? Because Abraham was born then Isaac, then Jacob, then the twelve sons of Jacob, and one of them was Levi. Levi's descendants became the Levitical priesthood. They all paid tithes themselves. Up until it got to the high priest. Verse 10, For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So the Levitical priesthood didn't exist when Abraham met Melchizedek. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek? The reason why was there must be forgiveness of sins, or you cannot have the new covenant. And so as long as the Levitical priesthood was there and they offered animal sacrifices... They could not take away sins. So Jesus, who was God, had to die, be resurrected, and become the high priest forever. Verse 12, For the priesthood being changed from physical human beings to the Son of the living God, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. What law? The law pertaining to the priesthood. The priests don't offer sacrifices anymore. Jesus does. You see? Verse 13. 
For he of whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe. Jesus was not even born a Levite. And of that other tribe, which was Judah, gave no attendance to the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood. And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there arises another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. So physical priests were born. They offered sacrifices. They had to then dump the blood out, wash the pots and pans. They died. They couldn't save anybody. And then another generation of Levitical priesthood would be trained, and they would do the same thing. But here, Jesus has an endless life. You don't have to look for another high priest to offer sacrifices that could not even forgive sins. Here is the one and only that can forgive all sins. Verse 17, For he testifies, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Forever means exactly what it says. Forever. It's the corresponding word here in the Greek for the Old Testament, olam, which means time out of mind. You can't think of a time in the past or in the future. Melchizedek was the original high priest. And Abraham gave tithes to him. And then he gave that authority to the Levitical priesthood. And then when he came and died for our sins, he took that authority back to himself. So he is the only one that we can be saved through. Nobody else. No matter what the New Agers say. We are not gods unto ourselves. Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and only when our sins are forgiven can we have hope of being born as a Son of God like Jesus. Verse 18 and 19. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitability thereof. So there was a change from the physical, fleshly, priesthood, which profited nobody. If you want to get real technical, all it was was a burden. All it was was something to give people jobs until the real thing came along. <laughs> I'm just being facetious. But it couldn't forgive a sin. Period. Nothing. Verse 19, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did for the which we draw nigh unto God. So see, a change in an inadequate priestly system was a necessity. There was no forgiveness in the Old Testament. But there is in the New Testament a better hope, a better covenant, a better priesthood, because this priest lives forever. Verse 20. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest. So the father is the one you might say that swore him into office. Verse 21. For those priests were made without an oath. As they were just born a Levite. So they were trained. And they went into the priestly duty. But this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus is it. Nothing else. And this new system of sacrifices that's going to be coming in Jerusalem can't do a thing for the people. They're obsolete. Verse 22. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue. They couldn't go on because they were not immortal. They died. But this man, the comparison goes on, because he continues ever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto him, or come unto God by him. 
seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. Here's the key. That second goat, the scapegoat, the goat of departure, departed this earth and went into the throne room, the Holy of Holies of the Father. And He is interceding right now for every one of us. And sometimes we make mistakes. We know something's wrong, but we can't pinpoint it. And the Holy Spirit in us is agonizing and is actually sending messages. And God the Father forgives because Jesus is there interceding for us. We've got it made if we realize what we're doing and who it is that is our high priest. Verse 26, For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. He told us we couldn't depart out of this world. We had to rub elbows with the sinners, but we weren't to participate in their sins. Verse 27, Who needs not daily as those high priests, the Levitical priesthood, to offer up sacrifice first for their own sins and then for the people's? For this he did once when he offered up himself. That's all it took. One sacrifice of a God and all the sins of the world can be forgiven. Verse 28 For the law makes men high priests which have infirmity. The old covenant made people priests who still were sinners. But the word of the oath which was since the law makes the son who is consecrated forever. So Jesus is the one who is bearing our sins. But who will be reconciled by this high priest? Who will be? I think this is important for us to understand. If we go according to the churches of this world, and I do say churches of this world because many are called, but few are chosen. And those who are called play church. They do the best they can. They're sincere. Never doubt it. They are honest the best they understand. But they just don't understand because God's Spirit is not working actively inside them, only externally drawing them, but they won't follow through with obedience. Therefore, He never gives it inside of their mind. But they're doing the best they can. They'll not be turned away when their time comes. Notice what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22 and 23. For as in Adam all die. Why? Because we've all sinned. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. Well, if in Adam all die... Has every human being that's ever existed died? Does anybody know of someone that's still living from the days of Adam or Noah? Or maybe they stowed away on the ark. Does anybody know them? No. We see grave sites everywhere, don't we? We know that every person born dies. Everyone. No exception. But every man in his own order... The word order is number 5001 in the concordance of the Greek language. It means there is a series of resurrections. The very first one was Jesus. The second one is going to be those that are called today and are going to be reconciled now and at the seventh trump when Christ returns will be changed. But then there is still an order of resurrections. And that's what the rest of the holy days and the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles pictures in God's plan of salvation. And yet when I met with those five ministers in Anniston, Alabama, they didn't understand when I showed them there is an order of resurrections. All they knew was if I walked out that door and I didn't get right, and get back in the church of Christ, and I died, I was in hell forever. And they'd wave at me once in a while, but, you know, that's not the way it is. Those people have died. What about those people that died before Jesus was ever born? 
They didn't have a chance to accept Him as their Savior. What about those who were not born of Israel, who lived in Africa, or maybe even in the Americas, in Russia, in China? They didn't have satellite television in those days. What about before the flood? They didn't have it. Maybe they did. And it was destroyed by the flood. But after the flood, when everything started over, they didn't have instant communication. How could they know who Jesus was? They didn't have radio stations, short wave that went around the world with religious program after religious program, or satellite television so they could blanket the earth. They didn't have it. Is God responsible for those people? Or are they just lost? That's what atonement is all about. Romans chapter, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter 11, verse 1 in the first part of verse 2. I say then, has God cast away His people? God forbid. He actually forbids us to even think that Israel will not have an opportunity for salvation. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away His people which He foreknew. I believe that's as simple as you can get. And if people understand that, then what are the preachers going to say then? God said He hadn't thrown them away. What is He going to do with them then? They haven't accepted Christ. That's evident. Most Jews today have never accepted Jesus Christ. Of course, that's only one tribe, Judah. Let's drop down for time's sake now to verse 5. Even so then, at this present time, this present age, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. If there's a remnant, that's only a small part. And if He hadn't cast them away, that means the rest of them must have their opportunity. Only a small part are having their opportunity today. Verse 7, What then? Israel has not obtained that what he seeks for, but the election has obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Today, a certain number of people called the elect. Many are called, few are chosen. Who are returning with Jesus in Re Revelation 17, 14? Called, chosen, and faithful. So those who are the elect are the faithful ones. They're not blinded today. All the rest are blinded. And I don't care what you do, you can't unblind them unless God does it. Drop down now. Well, before we do, I wanted to show you that. Now I want to show you one scripture that's dynamite. Hebrews chapter 11. This is called the faith chapter. It goes all the way back to Adam in the Garden of Eden, and his son Abel, who was righteous. Then it goes through many, many of the people in Old Testament times. And then finally, the writer of Hebrews gives up and says, hey, there's so many that have been faithful, I can't even write it down. But in verse 35, notice what these elect are going to have. The last part of this verse says, they would not accept deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. This is why there are certain people called the elect today. They're righteous. They will not give up. I don't care what stands in front of them. I've known people who have given up jobs and lost all their security in this world because they were required to work on God's Sabbath and holy days. And they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it because they were after a better resurrection. Why in the world would we walk this way? If it says better, that means there is a lesser. I mean, it's only logical, isn't it? If you say, oh, he was the first, that automatically means there's going to be a second, doesn't it? Or you wouldn't say, oh, he's the first. You'd just say, oh, he's here. You know, when you have a party and you invite somebody and say, oh, you're the first to arrive. That means somebody else is coming too. And that's what he's talking about. If there's a first resurrection, there's got to be a second. Let's go back now to Romans 11. Verse 15. 
For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, the blinding of Israel, what shall the receiving of them be, or Israel, but life from the dead? Israel is going to be resurrected from the dead. And they're going to have opportunity for salvation. But it won't be until Christ returns. Let's drop now, down now to verse 25 and 26. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Blindness has come over Israel until God is called all He's going to call from the different nations today. Verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved. When are they going to be saved? Today? No, we've already been told that. As it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. When will this happen? Revelation chapter 11 begins to tell us, because some of us are being called today. Others are blinded and will not receive salvation until a certain period of time when the Deliverer comes out of Israel, or out of heaven, and delivers Israel. In Revelation chapter 11, <clears throat> Revelation 11, verse 15, And the seventh angel sounded, now, the significance of this is, the book of Revelation is made up of seven seals. The seventh seal, when it's stripped open, has seven trumpets. And the seventh trump, then there are seven last vials to be poured out upon a sinful world. But, we will never come under the wrath of God. So that means at the seventh trump, that's when the resurrection of the true elect today will take place. We will be changed, come out of graves if you're dead, and we'll have our new glorified body, and we'll be caught up to meet Christ at what looks like a sea of glass in Revelation 15. Then the seven last vials are the will be poured out upon sinners. There will be no Christians left. They will all be at the sea of glass, at the wedding supper of the Lamb, getting your reward. Now notice... Verse 15, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Christ, and of our Lord, and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Now the minute the seventh trump sounds does not mean that He's overthrown the governments of this world that instant. No, He's just as good as done it. Because He's going to pour out several vials and then intervene in world affairs to take over. But now drop down in verse 18. This tells us what we want to know. The nations were angry. They're going to fight Christ. Your wrath, God's wrath has come. He's going to pour it out on these seven vials only upon the nations of the world, not His elect. And the time of the dead. What about all those that are in their graves? That they should be judged. They're going to be resurrected. And they're going to live God's ways. He's going to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Then they will be judged whether they will enter into the kingdom of God or not. Notice what else is going to begin to happen when the seventh trump sounds. And that you should give reward unto the, your servants, the prophets, to the saints, and them that fear your name, small and great. That is going to be the time when the elect today will be caught up to meet Jesus at what looks like a sea of glass. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Remember the seventh trump of Revelation is the last trump. There is none after it. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 to 54. Now this I say, brethren... And Paul is talking in this chapter, it's the resurrection chapter. He's already said in verse 20, and 20 through 23 that each man would be resurrected in his own order. 
And just like all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, that's our present state, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, what did it say at the seventh trump in Revelation 11, 11, then verse 18? That's when reward would be given to those who feared His name, His prophets, His servants. And here it is, the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This is when the reconciliation process for us will be completed. Not for the rest of the world. It's only about to begin. Only for those from righteous Abel up to all those until the seventh trump sounds. Only the elect will be changed into immortal bodies. Verse 54. For when, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. This is the atonement for us. All of our sins forgiven. Therefore, God can give us an immortal life, a perfect body to go with perfect character because He finds no sin in us. Now, very briefly, I want to turn to Luke chapter 19. Because, brethren, today is your day to be reconciled. What is the purpose of God reconciling you and me instead of the rest of the world at the same time? Why? Luke chapter 19, verse 11 through 19. I'll read some and summarize parts. And as they, this is the disciples walking with Jesus, heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he, he was nigh to Jerusalem. And notice why else. Because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. The disciples thought that it was going to happen in their lifetime before they died. So here's what Jesus said. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and a return. He called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him. That's the people of this world. And only ten servants were following him. And they sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man reign over us. That's the world today. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, this is Jesus gone into the heavens, and at the seventh trump, he's going to start intervening. Then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, or he had called, given his Holy Spirit, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. This is an analogy. Then came the first, saying, Lord, your pound has gained ten pounds. What did Jesus say to him? Well, you good servant, because you've been faithful in a very little, have you authority or rulership over ten cities? And the second came, saying, Lord, your pound has gained five pounds. See, everybody's different. We all have different backgrounds, so we all cannot be judged equally. So God will not expect something of someone who has no education that He does from somebody that has a Ph.D. If they're called, and they can understand more, you see. And He said likewise unto him, Be you also over five cities. So God is calling the elect today for rulership positions. Kings, priests, judges to rule the world. Why are we going to be judging? Because everybody else will be resurrected from the dead. They haven't had an opportunity for salvation. They're blinded today. In Revelation 2, <clears throat> Revelation 2, and I want to close today with encouragement.
for each one of us. We've seen right here in Luke that your reward for obedience to Him today and being productive with what you have to do with is rulership. He will decide whether you or I will be fit for one city, five cities, ten cities, a whole continent. He will rule the world. That's already determined. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 26 and 27, He that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, that doesn't say compromise and live however you want. To him will I give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. In other words, we will have all power just like Jesus. He is the super king of the world. We will be lesser kings. But we will be immortal. They can't assassinate us. So we can force them to obey God's law and force them to be happy and prosperous and rich and everything else. And then all of a sudden it will dawn on them. These laws work. Where was I back there? And we'll say, you were blinded. But now the light switch has been turned on. But you will have the opportunity to show people the right way of life. In Revelation 3.21 To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in His throne. Rulership. In Revelation chapter 5 the last part of verse 9 identifies who He's talking about and has redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. Here is Jesus, has reconciled. And now notice what they're going to be doing. And has made us, the elect today, unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Haven't you ever seen on TV these shows where they show the little babies in Somalia and Africa bloated up? Their little arms are nothing but skin over bones and they're dying and the flies all over them. Don't you want to just pick them up and take them and feed them proper nutrients and see them grow and develop? That's what we're going to have opportunity to do. We're going to straighten up every evil there is in this world under Jesus Christ, the perfect King. If we will only be faithful. In Revelation chapter 20, Revelation 20, verse 4, last part of verse 5, and verse 6. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. They is plural. Jesus is one person. And judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither...